Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland, my weekly show where we take a deep dive into a particular film, and we're going to be talking about The Blue Eagle, another 1926 film from John Ford, and I have my buddy Griff, who's going to be popping up on, on here quite frequently for John Ford. Griff, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Shane, thanks for having me on, always a pleasure. Absolutely. And for those who haven't tuned into the show before, we have three segments. We have our coming attractions, which are going to be for September 1st. It's September, and I don't like it. <laughs> As somebody who works at a university, it's like, well, there goes the summer. Um, getting back into things. And then we have our feature of the week. And then we'll be getting some recommendations out to all of you. But starting with one of the most challenging weekends usually for film and the box office is Labor Day weekend because I feel like most people are like, oh, no, I have to go out and enjoy my last weekend of the summer. So not a lot of people going out to the movies, which is kind of a shame because there's a particular film coming out that I'm definitely excited about. And I know Griff is. Griff, what's the one film you're most excited about? Definitely The Equalizer 3 with Denzel Watt. Washington because I thought the first two were really good. I was a big fan of the original series from the 1980s starring Edward Woodward. And even though the modern Equalizer series now on CBS hasn't been getting the great reception that the original series has gotten. I personally think it's a very, very good series. And I think uh, Queen Latifah and that cast has definitely done that series justice. Yeah, I feel kind of bad because, like, I feel like it's hard for network dramas to really, like, hit on a Sunday night. And I know that was that got, like, the Sunday night slot. Yeah. It's actually, it's it's hard to compete with HBO on Sunday night, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I actually got to interview one of the cast members of the show, and I heard some decently good things about it. And she definitely enjoyed her experiences with it. And I just, before we started recording, came to the realization that the lead from the originals from The Wicker Man. So now I'm actually a little bit more excited to maybe check that out. So it's not just a gag from Wolf of Wall Street where Rob Reiner starts freaking out and yelling about people calling during the Equalizer. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> they have one of the best scenes in that movie. Yeah. Hello. He just starts talking in a British accent. Yeah. I I am a big fan of the Equalizer films. And, you know, a lot of people are just like, oh, it's just Denzel doing what Liam Neeson did and Sean Penn did and everybody else did. But, like, there's, like, there's something that Denzel Washington brings to every role, and he's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that... um home improvement store scene in the first one is pretty right. legit. Um, and I'm excited that like they're taking this to like Italy and he's like, I'm off the grid. I'm enjoying my life in this small Italian town. And you know, he has to go up against the mafia. And it's just like, I like that idea. I think it's a, a fresher take to um, go with it because I'll give him that. They've definitely kept the stories pretty fresh. Cause the last one, had to do with like dirty soldiers and stuff like that from his past. So I appreciate it. It does seem like this is going to be the last one apparently, but you know, hopefully it goes out with a bang. Um, along with this weekend in terms of releases, there's some, <laughs> there's some strange releases coming out. You have a movie about a killer sloth. You have a long gestating sequel to a lovely little French animated film. Ernest and Celestine got some Hillary Swank, some Shutter releases, but the one that I'm most excited about because it just seems so weird is Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. <laughs> and I saw the trailer; it seems really, cr uh, really quirky and funny and weird. Simon Pegg's in it as this like offbeat, strange like Scottish investigator, and Neil Gaiman is voicing this mongoose and i'm like what <laughs> and i swear i saw the trailer a couple of times i'm like you know what i'm sure my wife jess would love this we saw the trailer together she's like oh my god is this the talking mongoose case i'm like of course you know about <laughs> this so 
I'm I'm excited to see it. I'm really hoping that it's weird and quirky and offbeat the way that the trailer sold it and that it's something interesting and does something interesting with it. It has quite the premise, so we'll see how they do with it. But hopefully at least some of these movies make some money over Labor Day weekend. Or maybe it's just Barbie's going to win the box office again. You never know. We'll have to find out. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't either. The only thing is, though, if Barbie does win the box office again, that's really bad news for the Equalizer. Because that means like it did not make money. And that makes me very sad. So let's uh, show Anton Fuqua and Denzel some love and go check out the Equalizer this weekend. Now, getting into our feature film, which... This is a ride. I did not expect this movie to go in all the different directions that this goes. But we have The Blue Eagle, which is a Navy film. So it's about a couple naval officers. And just the ever slightest background, because there's not a whole lot of background on the film that I was able to find. We do have these reels, these copies of the film, thanks to the Library of Congress, and UCLA Film and Television Archive, so each of them have a copy of the film, but both of them are missing a reel. So that's why it's roughly around, like, the 50-minute mark. To be honest, I didn't feel like anything was, like, glaringly missing. I feel like the story flowed decently well, but just to give you a more specific look into exactly what this film is about... So, like I said, this is a 1926 film. It's an action drama. George and Big Jim are comrades in the Navy, but rivals outside of it, both fighting for the love of Rose, the local policewoman's daughter. When the war is over, Father Reagan tries to unite them against dope traffic that has George's brother in it and to make them settle their differences through a boxing fight. Let me preface this. This movie's 50 Minutes yet goes through all of these things. But Griff, what are your general thoughts on The Blue Eagle? I definitely liked it more than the pre previous John Ford mm -hmm. Silent movie I watched, North of the Hudson Bay, which yeah. is what we discussed the last time. I, I enjoyed the story better. I, I thought it was kind of neat how it went in those different directions, especially when Father Reagan tried to get the two main characters together to put aside their differences in, in order to try to crush this dope ring. Mm -hmm. And Although I was a little disappointed that that German U-boat attack was cut from the movie, that particular scene was missing, mm -hmm. I thought the submarine chase towards the end was really cool. You know, just as with North of the Hudson Bay, excellent cinematography for that time. And also the boxing match at the end, the close-ups were uh, pretty amazing to see as well. You know, again, John Ford was just ahead of his time. Absolutely. It definitely does reinforce just how talented a director that John Ford is that even like, to be fair, he had been directing for 10 years at this point and probably made dozens of movies at this point. The only reason we haven't been able to go through all of them is he they're missing roughly like 40 something of his films, which right. is sad. But, you know, I feel like that's a bit common for early cinema. What they filmed on was not exactly the easiest to keep going and to preserve. But thank you, Martin Scorsese. <laughs> Keeping preservation going. Yeah. But I the especially like you said, the close-ups and how well he could put that camera up there and get that performance out of his actors is so great. And we got a double dose of boxing in this movie because we had a brief fight at the beginning of the movie. Right. But like that's a legit fight at the end of this film and they're going at it and it's exciting. It's well edited. It builds up that tension and suspense. Yes. Like you said, it is disappointing that we missed out on one of the big action sequences of the film, but you know, they're like invasion of this, like hideout of these dope traffickers. Like there's some heavy emotional moments. Like not everybody makes us out. Okay. Um, especially some of the loved ones of the, our main characters. <laughs> I I expected the love story to be like a much bigger part of this movie, 
But I also thought it was hilarious how, like, she's just like, I want both of you. And they're like, you're going to have to choose. She's like, well, screw both of you. <laughs> and just runs off on them. And then tries to flirt with a cop immediately after. And he's just like, get out of here. You, the Janet Gaynor character didn't yeah. have as big a part in it as I would have expected her to. Well, yeah, and Janet Gaynor went on to star in the original Star is Born. Right. And, like, so she had uh, some big moments in her career. And, like, this one, she just rolls up this crazy free spirit and is just like, nope, I'm going to do my thing. Which, it's very interesting for a film in the mid-20s for a woman to just be going like, yeah, well, I'm just going to go on this next man. <laughs> starts flirting <laughs> with a cop, uh, messing around with both of them, insinuating that she wants to have a a polyamorous relationship with the two of them and they're just they're not about it um george o'brien who plays george was in the previous film that i did last week the three bad men and think he did gives a good performance william russell um i have to say like one of the early shots in this movie when they're showing them in the submarine i wonder what the oil budget was on this movie because they obviously were trying to make them seem very, very sweaty from all the work they were doing. I'm just like, Oh my God, they're like glistening. It's just like, you could probably like reflect light off of them at that point. And, you know, I think the two between O'Brien and Russell had really good chemistry together. And, you know, this is just such an unexpectedly wild movie that goes in so many different places for 50 minutes. I'm just like, I had a lot of fun with this. I rather enjoyed this quite a bit. And this is probably close to the top of the John Ford movies that I've watched so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think of his earlier films, I'm predicting that the Blue Eagle is probably going to be my favorite. Mm -hmm. It certainly has a lot going for it. It mixes a lot of different kinds of genres. Like, there's this crime thriller element with, like, the dope chasing. It's a sports movie. There's boxing in it. It's a love story. They're fighting over this woman. And as a good budding friendship, they go from enemies to frenemies to friends. And in the end, it's just like, good for them. And it's well shot. It's well put together. It is John Ford. So that's probably something you should expect. But I guess, Griff, are there any other things that stood out to you specifically about the film? Actually, going back to what you were saying earlier, when they were, you know, um, moving the coal, and you know, in order mm -hmm. to power the power the ship, yeah, I mean, the the way that they filmed it, you know, so realistically, yeah, and you're you're right, you know, light could just you know gleam off of them, you know, that's that's how realistic it was, you know, especially for that time. Oh, I imagine if I was doing that, I probably would be sweating literal buckets. Um, with how hot and ins like they did act you're right they did a really good job of making that like boiler room seem very very realistic it was grummy it was small <laughs> everybody's a little tense like from the start george and uh big tim get in an argument about stuff and they have to break up the scuffle and stuff like that it's just there's a lot of tension there and i would imagine there would be trapped in tight quarters and hot and working your ass off and everything. So there's definitely some authenticity here. There's fun to be had. There's some emotional moments. And, you know, I think this is a really good film, uh, something pretty entertaining. And I feel like this, among the ones that I've done so far, this is definitely one of the ones that I feel like I can most like recommend to people today because there's just so much going on in it and it moves really well uh really well it has great action those boxing scenes i de uh, definitely stick out and boy they went for it just swinging hands but anything else Griff? I would recommend it to any John Ford fan, any silent film fan, and any fan of sports movies, especially boxing. You know, compare those boxing matches to movies like Champion and Rocky and The Fighter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it isn't quite as, doesn't have quite the flair of, say, like Raging Bull, but Scorsese mm -hmm. was going for something different with that. But like, yes. this definitely is like, 
it's a really well shot action scene. And it's very interesting at this point because I've seen John Ford shoot um, riverboat chases and boxing matches and horse chases and all kinds of stuff so far. So he definitely has a knack for some throwing some action in his movies. So that's pretty exciting. But you could go check out the Blue Eagle. It's I think it's on multiple YouTube channels. It looked like um, the one that I watched. I'm trying to remember exactly which one it was. It some of the footage definitely is a little grainy and not as polished. But you know, it, for the most part, it's pretty clear, especially for like an older film that this it wasn't like I don't know, like M or. Uh, Metropolis or any of like those bigger movies from the 20s that like they probably spent a lot of time trying to like really glean up and make sure that they have really nice copies of but definitely worth a watch so head over to YouTube and commit the 50 some minutes and have a good time but Griff it's time to give everybody some recommendations what's the film that you wanted to recommend to everybody Actually, Shane, the last movie I saw in theaters was Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. Recently, I saw Sleepless in Seattle for the first time, which turned 30 this year. Mm -hmm. I, de I definitely highly recommend it. You know, it's more than just, you know, a rom-com, a romantic drama. There's something deeper there. And I loved how there were parallels with that to the old Cary Grant Deborah Carr movie An Affair to Remember, which actually is mentioned frequently throughout Sleepless in Seattle. That's one that I haven't I haven't checked out either of Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan's uh romance films like Sleepless in Seattle, You've Got Mail. So I'll have to eventually. I know I'm gonna be rewatching uh When Harry Met Sally soon. It's uh that's like peak rom-com from like 80s on there but i'll definitely eventually check out sleepless in seattle the couple of recommendations that i have so new film that i watched so this is this is more of a specific recommend for anybody who watched the show metalocalypse which is like a heavy metal animated show about a crazy like death metal band to get into some crazy hijinks they actually made a Ending film to wrap up the series Army of the Doomstar that's out on VOD. I think as of right now, you can only buy it for $19.99, but soon it'll be available for you to be able to rent. But for somebody who only saw like a couple episodes of Metalocalypse, but had a lot of fun with it, this is an epic, crazy finale. Definitely worth a watch as if you're a fan of Metalocalypse, which... I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I feel like if you watch Metalocalypse, you're probably going to go find this movie when it, it's available on VOD. Um, a film that I watched for the first time for, uh, for my other podcast, Rowan in the Wasteland, is Journey to the Beginning of Time. And this is a fantasy film with a group of kids. It's a 1955 Czech film about a group of kids who wind up going back in time to try to find like the dawn of like living organisms. And they're going through like the ice age and the Cretaceous period and all these different things, seeing all these dinosaurs, mammoths, all kinds of things. And it's a very simple premise. It's that premise. And it just keeps going for like an hour and 20 minutes, but the animatronics and the stop motion animation for this 1955 film were really, really impressive. So it's a fun fantasy time, um, going back through time kind of adventure. Definitely worth a watch. It's on the Criterion uh, channel right now. Mm -hmm. And then one film that I rewatched because my brother and I are going to be doing a special series on film noir. And I rewatched The Night of the Hunter from director Charles Lawton and starring Robert Mitchum as Harry Powell, man of love and hate. Mm -hmm. And he is so creepy and unnerving and so fantastic in that film it's a gorgeous film and it's only like 90 minutes and it is a lean thriller that'll definitely put you on edge so there's some recommendations for you all yeah the night 
Yeah, The Hunter was a very, very good film. I haven't seen it in a while. It, it's interesting how at the time it didn't do well at the box office, but now it's considered one of the great thrillers of all time. And when I was researching that movie, it's interesting to know that Charles Watt and the director apparently dislike children for whatever reason. So Robert Mitchum actually stepped in and directed the children. That is very interesting, and this is only the only film that Charles Lawton actually directed, which is fascinating. Apparently, this film is on MGM+. Plus. Right. So if you're one of the five people who have MGM+, Plus, you could go watch it. Yeah. Um, you could also rent it on VOD, on Amazon, Vudu, YouTube, Apple uh, TV, so it's out there. I have, um, I have it on Criterion Collection. That's one of my favorite criterions that I own. But that's a wrap on this episode of Welcome to the Wasteland. Hopefully you'll tune in next week where my wife Jess is coming back on to talk about John Ford's film Upstream. So we're moving along and eventually we'll make it to the 1930s. He had quite a few 1920s films. He was a busy guy. Kept busy making all these films. But Griff, thank you so much for coming on and you'll be back before you know it, honestly. Always a pleasure, Shane. Absolutely. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer. <laughs>